I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce the last session. Um, Ron Garan, amazing NASA, former NASA astronaut, spent 70, well, has flown 70 million miles in space around the Earth, which is pretty impressive. Being a Wan Young World counselor for the fifth time is even more impressive, Ron, may I say. Described coming back down to Earth one time as, as being uh, thrown over Niagara Falls in a barrel that was on fire and then having a car crash. Um, but what's fantastic about Ron is he brings everything together for us in a really amazing perspective that only somebody who has spent so much time up in space looking down on Earth can. So Ron, please give us a bigger perspective. Great to see you. Thank you. So yeah, as uh, David said, this is my fifth One Young World, and in Johannesburg, I went a couple of minutes over, and there was this hook that came out from behind the stage and just yanked me off. So I, Martin was uh, complaining today about he was keeping every, he was the only thing standing between everybody and lunch, well, I'm the only thing standing between everybody and a block party. So <laughs> my goal is to talk faster than Layla did um, to, to try and get through this. Um, impossible, yeah, <laughs> nothing's impossible. So, but... Um, maybe I'll, I'll buy a little bit of time by trying to wrap up this incredible day uh, a little bit and, and tie some of the themes together. Um, and it really has been an incredible day. I heard some, some key themes. I heard that we're all interconnected. I heard that we need to take a long-term approach. I heard that solutions have to extend beyond a single lifetime even, um, that we need to shift our perspective and that we need to take a big picture perspective. And Jane and Tabor talked about Biosphere 2 and, and how the goal was to, to create a closed life support system. And that is a good goal. That's a, you know, when we do spacecraft design, that's one of the major goals. A cl create a closed life support system. A life support system that reuses 100% of its resources. You don't have to resupply the resources. The truth of the matter is, on Biosphere 1, on Spaceship Earth, we do not have a closed life support system. That means that at our present rate, we're using up resources faster than, than, than they're being replenished, which means on our present trajectory, there will come a time where we will use up the resources necessary for life. And so we need to do something about that. And so one of the, one of the things I saw today is, is all these beautiful pictures that I saw of our, of our planet from the ground level or maybe a little bit above the ground level. So we're going to zoom out. We're going to zoom out to what I call the orbital perspective. We're going to zoom out to a, to a vantage point where hopefully all the pieces of the puzzle come into view and uh, we can see how they, what picture they paint for our society. And so before I get into that, though, I want to talk about one specific image. I want to talk about NASA image designation AS8-142383. Now, the reason why I want to talk about that is because that image changed my life, and it changed your life. In fact, I think it changed the entire course of human history. And the reason why I want to talk about it is because images can change our perspective. They can change the way we see ourselves. And there's no image that changed ourselves more than NASA image AS8-142383, more commonly known as Earthrise. And the story of Earthrise started on a winter morning, uh, December uh, 1968, and on top of the tallest, the, most, the heaviest, the most powerful rocket ever brought to operational status, the Saturn V, sat Apollo 8 and its crew, Commander Frank Borman, Command Module Pilot Jim Lovell, and Lunar Module Pilot Bill Anders. The objective of the mission was to be the first human spacecraft to fly from the Earth to the Moon, enter into orbit around the Moon, and of course, return safely back to the Earth. Three days after launch on Christmas Eve 1968, the crew entered into orbit around the moon. And as they passed across the dark side of the moon on its fourth orbit, they saw the Earth rising above the horizon. Frank Borman was the first one to see it. And he called out in excitement to the others and he took a, a black and white photo in the, in the ensuing chaos. Um, Bill Anders took the more famous color photo, and it was all captured on the flight recorder. So 
So I wonder if they understood what was happening, if they, knew, if they realized the significance of that moment in history. They had just become the first people in history to see our world as a planet hanging in the blackness of space and to, and to capture that for the rest of us. Some say that this is the most important photo ever taken, and it's been credited with inspiring the first Earth Day in 1970. And it was picked as the first of Life Magazine's 100 photographs that changed the world. And I think Bill Anders summed it up perfectly when he was asked about the photo. He said, we traveled all this way to explore the moon, and what we discovered in the process was the Earth. This picture, Earthrise, is the most potent symbol of our interconnectedness. It's a simple message. One planet, one people traveling together towards one common future. I believe that this photograph changed the course of human history for the better. This photograph came at the end of 1968. 1968 was a year that was filled with a lot of strife, a lot of unrest. There was massive prote protests in the streets of the U.S. and Europe and all around the world. There was conflicts. Yet, Life Magazine, or Time Magazine, chose the crew of Apollo 8 to be their men of the year for 1968, recognizing them as those that most influence events. Some of the other things that happened in 1968 was a lot of assassinations. One of those assassinations was Dr. Martin Luther King. But precisely one year before the astronauts were hurtling through space on their way to the moon, Dr. King gave a sermon, the Christmas sermon on, on peace, which gives words to what Earthrise evokes. It really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single common destiny and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are going to have peace on Earth until we recognize this basic fact of the interrelated structure of all reality. The interrelated structure of all reality. This is not a philosophy. This is not a cliche. This is fact. This is the reality of the world that we live in. And to illustrate this reality, I want to take you on a journey to, to, to space and back. And my most vivid childhood memory and the moment where I realized that I wanted to be an astronaut was July 20th, 1969. On that day, I as a young boy, along with millions and millions of people around the world, watched those first footsteps on the moon. Now, I don't think I would have been able to put it in these words at the time, but I realized at some level that we just became a different species. We became a, a species that was no longer confined to our planet. I wanted to be a, group, uh, be a member of that group of explorers that got to go out and look back upon ourselves. Four, uh, four decades later, on May 31st, 2008, that dream came true. That day, I launched on Space Shuttle Discovery. I remember leaving the crew quarters uh, at the Kennedy Space Center and boarding, boarding this van that we called the Astro Van that took us out to the launch pad. Each of us took our turns going, climbing into the, to the spacecraft, getting strapped into our seats. And we had a few hours there lying on our backs and it was, you know, occasionally we had time to think and, and what I thought of when I, in those down times was I'm strapped to four and a half million pounds of explosives, which is uh, it's just one of those wonderful moments that life gives you for self-reflection. And I, I briefly wondered what I was getting myself into. I had this uh, countdown timer right in front of me on the control panel of, of Discovery. And as it counted down, within 10 seconds, I got ready to launch into space. And you're going to hear our, our, uh, what we were saying to each other as we launched. Eight and a half minutes after launch, all three engines abruptly shut down according to plan. And all of us went from being pushed into our seats at three times our weight to being weightless instantly. And I thought to myself, we made it. And by that, I meant we survived. But I also was 
you, you know, really cognizant of the fact that my childhood dream of flying in space had just come true. And on that first day, that first day in space, the most spectacular moment was when I got to look out of the window for the first time. When my tasks were over, I got to unstrap, float over to a window, and see our planet. It just took my breath away. What really struck me in that first moment looking at the planet was just how unbelievably thin our atmosphere was. And I was hit with the realization, the sobering realization, that that paper-thin layer is keeping every living thing on our planet alive. And that, that was a kind of a scary thought. But in contrast to the fragility of our planet, you couldn't help but fall in love with the beauty of our planet. It was a constant dance of lights and colors. And as we passed onto the dark side of the orbit, it was amazing to see thunderstorms casting long shadows across the horizon and watch the clouds turn to pink and to red and to gray and finally black. And as we crossed into the dark side of the orbit, to see the earth come alive, to see all the, the lights of the towns and the cities, all the evidence of human activity all of a sudden come to life. It really gave you this sense that we live on this living, breathing organism, but you also thought about the environmental impact of what we were seeing. We also saw paparazzi-like flashes of thunderstorms. We saw auroras that felt so close that we could reach out and, and touch them. It, it was really an incredibly beautiful visual experience. But it was much, much more than just a visual experience. What I experienced in that moment was a profound sense of gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to see the, the planet from that perspective, but also gratitude for the planet that we've all been given and in some way that I really can't explain. Being separated from the only world I had ever known made me feel deeply interconnected with, with everyone. On it. My kinship extended much, a much greater radius than it ever had before. So I want to show you another image of our world, the blue marble. And I, I really do think that this is an incredibly potent image and, and describes in, in one picture how interconnected we all are. And this picture was taken four years after Earthrise by the crew of Apollo 17 on their way back from the moon. And it represents the last time that we as humans have seen with our own eyes the Earth from that vantage point. In 1987, author Frank White coined the term the overview effect in a book by the same name, which explores a shift in perspective that astronauts can have when they see the planet from space and in space. From that vantage point, we see the reality of our lives, that we live on a living planet. So if the overview effect is the shift in perspective that astronauts can have, the orbital perspective is what you do with that shift. The orbital perspective is the call to action that comes from the overview effect. The orbital perspective is the direct understanding that we are all inseparably interconnected. It's the overcoming of the false and limited mindset of separation, and it uses these truths to apply to a big picture, long-term view on our planet, on how we deal with ecological uh, issues, uh, and how we conduct our business. I want to give you one more image of our planet. Um, this is renowned astronomer uh, Carl Sagan, and one of the reasons why we all need to be talking about this in collective action, which is the main theme of what I want to talk to you about, is molecules don't have passports. And Carl Sagan said that. But Carl Sagan, back in 1970, requested that NASA turn the Voyager 1 spacecraft around and point it back at our planet. And as Voyager 1 left our planetary neighborhood for the fringes of our planet, it took this picture. And in this picture, you can see in the center of scattered light rays our world as a tiny point of light, as a fraction of a pixel. And that image that shows an even, you know, a broader view of our world inspired Carl Sagan to address our responsibilities to our planet and to each other. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit it. Yes, settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits, 
than this distant image of our tiny world to me you know the school is our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the big blue dot the only home we've ever known so this idea of one human family on a, on a pale blue dot is a nice idea, but what, what does it really mean? What does it mean in the real world? Now, I experienced what profound human collaboration is on my second flight to space, my second flight to space in 2011 when I launched from Kazakhstan on a Russian Soyuz rocket. And during my six months on the International Space Station, I would get into a routine where I would almost say goodnight to the Earth. As it was getting time to go to bed, I would go to the cupola, which is this windowed observatory on the bottom of the space station. And as I was getting ready to go to sleep, I would just look back at the Earth for a while. And as I would gaze at the planet and the beauty of the planet, I would wonder what the Earth is going to look like, what the world's going to look like in the next 50 years, the next 100 years. How far would we progress in, in tackling the problems facing our planet? And as I took in this beautiful scene, I was routinely hit in the gut with a sobering contradiction between the beauty of our planet and the unfortunate realities of life on our planet for a significant number of its inhabitants. Those that don't have enough food to, to eat, uh, clean water to drink, the poverty and the conflict that exists on our planet. And all of those woes, and many, if not all other woes, have both a cause and effect relationship to our environment. I launched into space with a belief that we already have all the resources, all the technology necessary to solve many, if not all, the problems facing our planet. So I spent a good deal of my time earth-gazing, pondering the question, if this is true, why do they still remain? And the seeds to the answer to that question were planted three years before on my first sp uh, space flight. And this is uh, us leaving the airlock on the third spacewalk of that mission. And during this spacewalk, my feet were clamped to the end of the space station's robotic arm. And with me attached to the arm, it was flown through a big maneuver across the top of the space station and back. So at the top of this arc, I was 100 feet above the space station, looking down at this incredible accomplishment of humanity against the backdrop of our indescribably beautiful planet 240 miles below. And as I hung there and took in this beautiful scene, you know, I was struck with the amazing technological accomplishment, of course, of the space station. It's arguably the most complica complicated, co complex structure ever built. But I was also in awe of the human cooperation that it represented. You have to realize that 15 nations, some of these nations weren't always the best of friends, some were on opposite sides of the Cold War, opposite sides of the space race, had somehow found a way to come together and do this incredible thing in orbit. And so as I hung there looking down at the space station, I wondered, what would the world look like if we had that same level of cooperation, that same level of unified action here on the Earth's surface? I was born in the year that Yuri Gagarin became the first person in, in space. Fifty years later, almost to the day, from the very same launch pad that Yuri Gagarin launched from, I launched into space on a Russian rocket with a couple of Russian military officers on a spacecraft called Gagarin. And as I stood there at the base of this rocket that would take us to space, I looked up at the rocket and I saw an American flag and a Russian flag side by side. And I thought, what an incredible example of what we can accomplish by working together. And there's no, there's no problem, I think, that requires more coordinated action than the problems facing the life support systems on, on Spaceship Earth. So you have to realize that for the first 15 years of my adult life, I trained to fight the Russian, my nation's most menacing enemy, right? And collaboration doesn't mean that we agree on all things. It means that we find the low-hanging fruit. We find the things that we agree on, and we start to work on those things. And by doing that, personal relationships develop, trust develops, and that can become a platform that we jump off to try and address the things that we don't agree on. I think one of the legacies of the International Space Station will be this shining example of international cooperation. And even though our space program started as a competition, it, there, it was always viewed... It was always viewed the opportunity for, for peaceful exchange of human knowledge. This need for collaboration really struck home to me about a month before I returned to Earth when I took this picture. And this picture shows this illuminated line. And I've always been one of these astronauts say you can't see any borders from space. Apparently I'm wrong because what this line is is the illuminated man-made border between India and Pakistan. 
And seeing that from space had a huge effect on me. And what dawned on me is this scar on the otherwise beautiful landscape, this barrier to collaboration was keeping innovative, creative minds on either side of that line from working together to solve the problems that they share in the same geographic location. And for the past 50 years that humans have been flying in space, astronauts and cosmonauts have commented on how beautiful, how tranquil, how peaceful our Earth looks from space. It truly is moving to see our planet from that vantage point. The point is not that we could look down and see a man-made border between India and Pakistan. The point is that we could look down at that same area and feel empathy for the struggles that all people face, to feel empathy for the planet that we live on, to feel empathy for the life support systems on our planet, and to realize that each and every one of us is riding through the universe together on this spaceship that we call Earth, that we're all interconnected, that we're all in this together, and that we're all family. And like I said, it, the space program started out as a, co a competition, but it really always, we always held out this, this belief that we could work together. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. Okay, here's where I start sounding like Layla. <laughs> I'll skip that. All right. So I don't want to give you the idea that I'm saying that collaboration is easy. It's not. But by taking an orbital perspective of collaboration, instead of looking at society as an arena for self-interested competition, we look at it as an organic system, a living whole. And collaboration in that sense is characterized by diverse organizations working together systematically towards objectives and goals that benefit the entire social body. So how do we do this? We do this through leadership. Now let's say somebody in here has an idea on how to increase sustainability, uh, social impact, uh, or some breakthrough ecological uh, idea for a breakthrough technology. It must be first noted that ideas are highly overrated. And what I mean by idea, ideas are highly overrated, while every great idea starts, or while every great accomplishment starts with a great idea, Ideas without action are empty. And every great accomplishment, of course, requires dedication and hard work for sure, but it also requires at times stepping outside of our comfort zone, step, stepping outside of the way we've always done things, to look at things at different angles, and to realize that any one of us, or any one organization for that matter, will not have all the pieces of the puzzle. But it's precisely those individuals and organizations that step outside of their comfort zones, and it's precisely at those moments where they have the courage to embrace new innovative partnerships and look at things from different angles, and collaborate across boundaries and borders and aisles, those are the ones that affect real change in this world, positive disruptive change. And to illustrate how stepping outside of your comfort zone can lead to disruptive change, I, I want to share with you a story of my return to Earth. When it was time to come home, my two Russian crewmates and I got into our spacecraft, we undocked, we did a couple laps around the planet, and as we crossed the south tip of South America, we turned our spacecraft around to point our engines backwards. And I, as I did this, I saw this crescent moon go by the, the window. We had this fiery, violent ride through the atmosphere. The parachutes opened. We got slammed all over the place. Eventually, we slammed into the ground. We bounced. We rolled. We flipped over. And we landed on our side. And now my window was pointed down at the ground. And out of my window, I saw a rock, a flower, and a blade of grass. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm home. And what was really interesting about that thought is I was home, but I was in Kazakhstan. And so for me, at that moment, my home wasn't just Houston, Texas, where I, at the time I lived with my family. My home was Earth. And our de definition of that word home has profound implications for how we treat each other, how we, how we deal with the problems facing our planet, how we deal with the environmental concerns that we all have. And... I think when we zoom out to the big picture, when we zoom out to the orbital perspective and we define our, our, our home in that way, a lot of the solutions to our problems become clear. So with that, I thank you. <laughs>